uh, webinar on planning complete low stress bike networks. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes to allow participants to join on. So in about a minute or two, we'll start our webinar and begin presenting. Please be aware as well that there is a question and answers box that participants can use um, to send us questions and we'll be able to take those at the end after presenting the materials. And if we don't have time to get to your question, we will also be posting this webinar to our YouTube channel and sending out to participants some of the materials as well as answering some of those questions that we weren't able to get to during this webinar. So I'm still going to take a moment uh, and in about a minute or two we'll begin. All right, all, so we're gonna begin now. I see that there is a good number of participants and we have a critical mass, so to speak. And so um, welcome to our webinar. So a quick overview. So I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists today who are gonna to talk about the newest technologies and strategies for complete low stress network planning um, for different scenarios as well as um, having the different work that their organization's doing to uh, implement these tools as well as how CalBike is using some of the advances in bike network planning for some of our work in the Central Valley. So um, my name is Forrest Barnes. I am a active transportation planner at CalBike and so we're especially interested uh, in promoting bike network planning, not complete low stress bike network planning um, around the state, not just through our advocacy, but also through our planning work, which includes some of our work in the Central Valley along uh, the stations in Merced, Fresno and Bakersfield um, that will be future high speed rail stations and making sure that everywhere in the Central Valley cities, you should be able to get around the bike shed on a complete low stress network. Um, and so included in some of that planning is some work with uh, tool design, which you'll hear from one of our panelists soon about um, some of the work they do and using some of the tools developed uh, with people for bikes. And some of these tools are open source and some are uh, paid and it really depends on your own situation. Um, but so, I'm gonna actually have Rebecca Davies take over from People From Bikes to talk about what actually are the basics and importance of complete low stress bike network planning and what are some of the tools that People For Bikes has used. So Rebecca, I'm gonna let you take that. Um, Great, yeah, thank you for it. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, sorry, were you gonna? Nope, that's fine. No, that, okay, great. Um, I'll just take a second here. All right. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I'm uh, happy to be here to chat with you all today about uh, the main thing I think about in my work, which is bicycle networks. Um, just again, yeah, you got a brief introduction, but again, my name is Rebecca Davies. I'm the Bicycle Networks Data Manager here at People for Bikes. Um, so one of my uh, my primary duties is managing our bicycle network analysis tool. And uh, that's what I'm going to just give you a brief overview about um, today. And uh, if you want more information later on about the sort of nitty gritty details, I'd be um, happy to talk to you about that. 
So first, I, I want to start off by just making sure we're all on the same page in terms of the definition of what is the bicycle network and what is a bicycle network analysis in general. So the way we here at People for Bikes think about bicycle networks is all the streets, paths, and crossings that bicyclists could use in a given area. So we define that as any um, roadway that a car might use, in addition to any other paths designated for bicyclists. So this would not include things like hiking trails that don't allow bicyclists, but um, we do count any, any roadway that allows cars as part of the potential bicycle network in a given area, whether that's a city or a neighborhood or some other region. So what is a bicycle network analysis then? It's a measurement of the safety and comfort of the bicycle network and how well it connects people to the places that they want to go using um, a safe and comfortable route. And we wanted to be able to measure the quality of bicycle networks um, in cities across the country. So that's why um, we partnered with Tool Design a couple years back and built the bicycle network analysis tool. Essentially, it is a piece of software um, that lowers the barriers to conducting a bicycle network analysis in a given city or neighborhood by automating the network analysis process. And I just put the link to uh, the results from that analysis on our website, bna.peopleforbikes.org, and we have a bunch of network analysis results for cities across the U.S. Um, and plus a few outside of the U.S. for comparison. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through an example for one of the cities that's in the BNA um, in California. So I'm going to use the city of Lompoc as an example. Um, we do have 55 cities in the BNA um, for California. So you can check and see if the city um, that, that you're involved with or that you live in is in the BNA. And, and if it's not, you can get in touch with me and we can talk about adding it. Um, but Lompoc is in there, and this is just a map showing the, the city boundary that we have for the city of Lompoc. So when we run Lompoc through the bicycle network analysis, first the bicycle network analysis rates every single um, pathway or road in the bike network. So as I said, that's every street usable by cars plus um, designated bike paths. And you can see here there are blue streets and red streets. Um, these are low stress in blue and high stress in red, and um, this is based on a series of criteria. I won't go in depth on that now, but essentially factors like what is the speed limit? How many lanes of travel are there? Is there bike infrastructure? What type of bike infrastructure? Is it separated or not? Um, factors like that are included in it, analyzing every single segment of every street that you see here and then rated as low or high stress based on those factors. Um, you, you may have seen other rating systems that have multiple steps. For instance, sometimes there's a scale of one to four to show kind of an intermediary uh, level of stress. But uh, in the BNA, there's only high and low stress. So it's a bit of a simplified measurement system. And you can see here for Lompoc, there's a lot of uh, streets that are low stress, but they tend to be uh, divided by these high stress roadways. Often those are kind of major roads, usually they have more lanes of traffic, higher speeds, um, things like that. So um, you can see that those kind of run right through the city and um, can cut people off from travel um, through different directions of the city. So that's the first output when the, from the bicycle network analysis. In addition, the network analysis produces a map of all the infrastructure in the city, all the bicycle infrastructure in the city based on the data that it uses. So we can see here there are these purple lines on some of the streets and green lines. The purple lines indicate conventional bike lanes. So this is just a painted bike lane on the street, but there's no um, buffer or separation. Um, that would look like this street, right? Conventional bike lane, we're familiar with that. We also see some of these green lanes, or sorry, green lines on the map. Those are off-street paths. So those are completely separated pathways. Again, something like this. Um, so the BNA identifies those types of infrastructure, 
Um, it also identifies if there are protected bike lanes on the street, so something with a barrier between the bicyclists and cars, um, or buffered lanes where there's a you know, painted differentiation. But there aren't either of those types of infrastructure here in this map of Lompoc. But just to give you an idea, here's a couple of, of pictures of uh, that, those kinds of infrastructure in other California cities. So the buffered lane, protected lane. So you'll find out where all of that kind of infrastructure is based on the maps from the BNA. And then also the BNA produces um, this heat map that I'm showing now. So this is a heat map based on a scale of zero to 100, where 100 indicates perfect connectivity, and that's the sort of bright blue color you see that's kind of more towards the center of the map. Um, zero in indicates very poor connectivity, um, which you can see around some of the edges of Lompoc. Um, and then there's a lot of areas that are kind of in between a little bit of a purplish color. So what this is showing is if you start in a particular part of the city, say you live there, you know, what, how, how good is your connectivity using only those blue routes, only those low stress um, bikeways to get to destinations within a very moderate biking distance, say a 10 minute bike ride. So if you live towards the center of Lompoc and you live within a 10 minute bike ride of a grocery store, you might have a good chance of being able to bike there using only those low stress streets. But if you live in one of these areas kind of on the fringe that has poor connectivity, you might not have a lot of options for biking to that destination near you. Maybe that's because you're blocked off by a high stress road or there's um, a lack of safe crossings across busy streets, things like that, that would prevent your journey using only low stress routes. So that's what this map is telling you, is and enabling you to see which parts of the city have better, experience better connectivity on the network and which parts of the city experience um, poor connectivity. And you could use this data um, and combine it with other kinds of data that you might have about a place. For instance, um, you could combine it um, with income data or race and ethnicity data or um, age or any other kind of demographic information you're interested in. You could um, layer those maps and see how well the bike network serves um, different kinds of communities based on, uh, based on this heat map. And you could get a sense for maybe certain populations that aren't served as well as others. You can also look at the map to understand and use the data to understand how well you can access different kinds of destinations. So the BNA uh, categorizes destinations into certain, certain types such as schools, um, basic services, jobs, things like that. This is a, the points on this map show parks around Lompoc. So you can assess how well the bike network is serving um, different parks throughout the city or how well residents can access parks based on where they live. And then on top of that, you receive um, a lot of numbers. <laughs> These are, this is the actual score for the city of Lompoc. And this is all related to the maps I just showed you. So um, you can see there's a top level score, which is a 58. That's on that same zero to 100 scale, but it's a score for the whole the city as a whole. Um, a 58 for um, on the scale of US cities is pretty good. Not a lot of cities score over 50 in the BNA. A lot of US cities are kind of in the 10 to 30 range. Um, so 58 is pretty good. Uh, I think the highest score in California in the BNA currently is uh, Davis, which has about a 71. Um, but you know, we can see year to year how these scores change. And um, you can also see how these scores apply to the different destination categories I was talking about. Um, for instance, the people category, which is a couple, um, couple levels below the, the overall score, um, that is, assesses how well people can uh, access other people based on uh, starting from where they live and where they can bike to. Like where can I bike to um, areas of high population density from my house using only a low stress network? So that's kind of what that's showing. And I won't go through every single destination category, but you can see things like grocery, hospitals, parks, uh, higher education, um, all sorts of scores. And, um, and they can range, which indicates um, whether those types of destinations are more or less accessible to the overall population. The uh, zeros don't necessarily mean that 
the destination is inaccessible, it might reflect a lack of that type of destination in the city. So we have to look, um, go back to the maps and look at that to, to understand exactly the zero scores. But all of these scores are combined and weighted to get the overall score. So um, I'm just, gonna, just a reminder of the different kinds of um, outputs from the map, and you can combine these two to see, well, um, for instance, if we look at the uh, southeast area of the map where it's a little bit um, more purple compared to the center of Lompoc, well, then you can go back to the network map and see that there are some uh, major roadways that are high stress, and that might be blocking off that southeastern area from the rest of the city. And so you can use the maps in those ways to identify where specific kinds of infrastructure um, or the absence thereof um, are preventing people from being able to have greater bike access throughout the city. And so a lot of the map, map data is really applicable for these um, detailed analyses of you know, how, what kind of infrastructure do we need or how are we going to uh, in, uh, improve access for different populations throughout the city. So kind of going between those maps, you can make those kinds of um, decisions based on the data. And so I just want to make, add a few more notes on the bicycle network analysis from People for Bikes um, in relation to what you might know about or hear about um, related to network analysis more generally and what we'll hear um, in the subsequent presentations in this webinar. So as a, as a software tool, the bicycle network analysis uh, advantage is that it's automated. It has national data coverage for the U.S. because it uses OpenStreetMap which is an open source um, data source, which means that anybody can use that data and anybody can contribute to it. It also means that we can create consistent and comparative ratings between places. We can compare Lompoc to other cities throughout California or the US because we're using the same network analysis rating system. And because it is automated and uh, because it can produce uh, network analysis in a, in a fairly short amount of time, for instance, I could run the city of Lompoc in the DNA in you know, an hour or less. Um, because of all those things, the network analysis, the bicycle network analysis is lowering the barrier to network analysis. The trade-off is that it's not as customized as a really in-depth um, network analysis might be for um, a city that's providing all of its, uh, all of the data that the city uses for planning purposes. Um, that could create a really customized analysis, whereas this is an automated version using OpenStreetMap data, using census data, and enabling people to compare across places. So that's where this tool really fits in, in the spectrum of different kind of network analysis options, is, is it lowers the barrier so that more cities and groups and um, community groups can have access to network analysis results without having to undertake the um, often sort of intensive process of using a lot of data sources and connecting the analysis more manually. So that's where we really see this tool fitting in um, and, and helping people um, access uh, network analysis results more readily. So that's all I've got for you today. I've just repeated the website at the Bicycle Network Analysis here and also my email. Uh, feel free to follow up. If, um, I can give you lots of information about all the details um, of, this, of this analysis. Um, I'm happy to do that. And like I said, happy to talk to you if you are interested in getting results from the BNA for a city that's not already on the website. Yeah, so thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I am really grateful for your explanation of this and actually use the BNA in my work and it's a really helpful visualization tool. And um, now I'm gonna have um, Brooke tool take over. Um, and present on um, rapid, rapid network implementation. I do wanna um, really remind the audience that there is the ability to ask questions throughout and that we will be um, answering those at the end with any given time. And I will also be sharing all of the resources that Rebecca had mentioned, websites, et cetera, um, to you all as well. So, um, Brooke, um, I'd like to hear from you next. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, Forrest and Calbike, for the opportunity to, to talk with you all today. Um, this is one of my absolute favorite topics, uh, rapid implementation of low-stress bike networks. And I'm going to um, share about 20 slides with the group today to um, really share all the direct work that we've been doing around the U.S., um, some best practices and, and things that we have learned along the way. Um, partnering with People for Bikes and other groups, um, and then also sharing some international examples as well. Um, you gave a nice introduction, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Brooke DeBose. I'm a Regional Director for Total Design, and I've been doing active transportation work in the Bay Area and New York City for about 15 years now. Um, I have the best job in the world. Um, so, um, I want to kind of dive in here. So over the last five years, um, you all probably know there's been a pretty major shift in the ways that cities have really approached uh, implementing bike infrastructure, right, where the emphasis is much more on building low-stress bikeways. Um, and looking back for more than 20 years, we had taken a more conventional approach by um, installing a lot of bike lanes, a lot of shared routes. Um, I'm sure that, that many of you on this call were pretty instrumental in getting some, a lot of those bike facilities in the ground. But what we found is that um, that more traditional approach really um, didn't move the needle much in, in terms of mode share, getting people on bikes, and it certainly really didn't address a lot of the, the safety um, issues for bicyclists on the road. Um, and so I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm sure many of you are really excited about protected bike lanes and all the new tools that we have in our toolbox today. Um, and now we're, we're looking at uh, getting a lot of these facilities on the street. I'm working with the city of San Jose right now where we're producing a proposed bike network of 400 miles of protected bike lanes. Um, and so now the, the big question is, how on earth do we get that all done? <laughs> Um, so I, I want to start and, and just kind of put some context here. This cartoon could be for any project that we work on um, related to, you know, transportation and urban environment. And it really shows the tension that typically caused when um, a bike lane project uh, is, is proposed. And I'm not sure. Are you showing my slides? Okay. If you can go ahead another slide. Great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, for me, this, this, this picture really depicts um, how we as humans react to change. We are incredibly scared of it, and we are, our minds tend to go to the worst possible outcome. Um, but the beauty of rapid implementation is that it really directly helps communicate what the vision is head on. It's no longer an ambiguous idea that gets rolled out over a 10-year process, um, and you can really see results on the ground very quickly. Um, rapid implementation all co also combats a very common issue that, that kind of plagues these traditional delivery or transportation projects and that they just take forever to come to life. And we, in the past, have gone out to a community and asked them for their ideas um, along the way over multiple years. And by the time the project actually gets built, many of those community members have moved on. There's other stakeholders involved that feel like they were never asked about the process. Um, and we're still getting stalled out. And so rapid implementation really gets around a lot of those issues. Um, next slide, please. So um, I wanna share exactly a definition of what rapid implementation is. Um, and it's really a, a, a pretty new approach that focuses resources um, from funding, um, city staff, consultants around engagement. Um, the advocacy community is key in this. It's really to deliver a full and complete connected network of high comfort bikeways very quickly. Um, the network typically starts with a central business district or a, a, a downtown, um, and a, it'll connect feeder routes um, um, to other parts of the city or, or urban area. Um, Rapid implementation or quick build projects use materials that are um, uh, fairly low cost and are meant to be in the ground for just a, a few um, years at a time um, so that we can kind of make adjustments on the ground. Um, I want to be clear that they can be pilot programs so you can really test out an idea, but they're not the same as pop-up events, which are typically, you know, happen over a weekend or a day and are really just sort of a, a demonstration. These are that meant to last in the ground for several years and ideally iterate over time with more permanent materials. Next slide. So um, let's rewind. Um, and if you can click ahead, uh, 
yeah, perfect. Um, really to where this idea started. Um, and we have to jump across the Atlantic for that to Seville, Spain. Um, in 2006, uh, Seville had about seven miles of pretty disconnected bikeway network um, segments. And on, you can see that on the left. And I think that that's what a lot of our bike networks across the US and North America look like today, um, is that we go for the opportunities where they're easy and rather than really thinking about a more connected network. Um, so the mayor came in 2006 uh, and decided to um, really develop a comprehensive citywide bike network um, that was largely uh, composed of separated bike lanes. And they added 40 miles of bike network over a single year. Um, and that investment created a connected network that reached almost all the neighborhoods in the city um, and really transformed Seville. Um, luckily, there was a lot of attention given to measuring these effects on ridership and safety in the before and after implementation, and I want to share the results here now. So if you can go to the next slide and um, click again. So this chart shows the mileage of the cycle track network in green, um, bicycle ridership in blue, and the crash risk in orange. And starting in 2006, um, Seville increased their bicycling use by over 400%, and at the same time, they also decreased their crash risk for bicyclists by over 60%. Um, now, Seville went on to expand their network in subsequent years, um, and their network is about 100 miles now. But what we're really seeing is that big jump in bicycling ridership and safety um, uh, improvements in that first year. And that's really what has um, uh, uh, brought a lot of uh, great ideas to folks like People for Bikes and their Big Jump project in many cities um, around North America. Um, and, and I think that that's a really critical point to rest on for just a minute is that um, if they had tried to build a system one mile at a time, um, they had a lot of political resistance, just like we do here in the U.S. and in Canada, um, but by getting it all down in one year, they were able to see results very quickly. Next slide. Um, so, catalyzed by the success that we've seen in Seville and also in other cities in Canada and elsewhere, um, a lot of uh, cities in North America are jumping on the bandwagon, and here are just a few examples up on the screen. I know that there's a lot of other cities and communities that are moving forward with rapid implementation projects and a lot of different iterations. Um, but I will say that People for Bikes has been um, uh, integral to this movement, really helping um, with the, their big jump cities, New Orleans, Providence, and elsewhere. Um, we've been working with the city of San Jose where uh, they got a grant from NACTO and the Knight Foundation. And then other cities like Fremont in the Bay Area are just going it alone and really moving forward um, with the political support that they have. Next slide. So um, I want to take the rest of my presentation to really um, share what we have learned by um, working with cities uh, throughout North America. Uh, it's been a great learning process. We've had some belly flops, we've had some successes, and really want to um, focus on what is going to be important for you to um, try rapid implementation networks in your own communities. Next slide. Um, so the first uh, element is really um, making sure that um, you don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And I think that when a lot of communities are trying innovative facilities out for the first time, they want to make sure that they're getting it perfect the first time around. And that, that iteration can um, uh, uh, really spend a lot of time and wheel spinning. So what we recommend instead is that you get your design to about 90%, get it in the ground, and iterate when it's on the ground. And the city of San Jose did this with their Better Bike Ways project in the past year, where um, I think that they made, you know, dozens and dozens of adjustments once they saw how buses and, and motorists and, and bicyclists were um, navigating um, the new area. Uh, next slide. Um, I'd say that um, make sure that, that you don't let fear of change really lead these projects. It's um, really striking. This is uh, 311 calls from the city of Calgary after they had installed uh, their cycle track network project in their city center. Um, the red uh, uh, bar is facing down are the negative calls, the yellow are neutral, and the green are positive. And as you can see in the first um, few days and weeks, they did get a number of negative calls really from people trying to navigate the system. And then those died off very quickly and they started to get some really positive calls. Um, and so the lesson for here and what the mayor really took to heart is 
don't let the initial um, blowback or, or, or questions really um, drive what your next steps are. Um, stay the course and, and, and see you know, where people can go with that. Next slide. Um, the other piece is uh, that results don't have to take forever to get into the ground. So um, with Edmonton's uh, uh, Central City Bikeway Network, they were able to see um, nearly doubling in, in um, bike trips in their first month there. Um, so that's really important data and information to share um, the successes with. Next slide. Keep going. Um, obviously, limited funding is uh, a, a critical issue for every community um, around the world, right? And the beauty of rapid implementation networks is that they can be uh, implemented with m much fewer resources. The, the, there's sort of two reasons for that. First is the, the time that you're taking to plan, design, construct uh, these facilities is much shorter, and so um, just the costs are minimized through that. The second piece is that the materials are just much lower cost because they're meant to be um, temporary. You're not pouring curbs, you're not changing drainage, all those major issues. Um, so in the examples that I'm sharing today, um, the costs of these rapid implementation networks really range between, I'd say, two to $20 million. And $20 million is the example from Seville that I shared. Um, San Jose, with their first phase of their Better Bikeways network, um, has just spent $2 million, and they've had a lot of really great success. Next slide. Um, so planning the network is really, really important. This is an example from New Orleans, where we're working with People for Bikes in the city there to um, implement 75 miles of rapid implementation bikeway network work, which is really exciting. So we're starting in their downtown. Um, using, using equity indicators in um, adjacent neighborhoods to really think about um, where to build a network from there on out. So, you know, keep in mind, the idea is that you start in a very focused neighborhood with a very dense and connected bikeway network, and then you radiate out from there. Um, so for New Orleans, really leading with equity to make sure that underserved neighborhoods are connecting to their downtown has been critical. Next slide. Um, selecting the, the right bikeway type is, is critical for these networks. We're really only talking about low stress facilities um, so that uh, all people of all ages and all abilities can use these um, facilities. And there's a very um, simple formula that we use to determine what those facility types are. Next slide. Um, the, what we're showing up here is um, what Federal Highways is using now and will be in the forthcoming Astro Bike Guide that we're currently writing. Um, and really what it means is that the higher the vehicle volumes and the higher the vehicle speeds, the more protection and separation we provide for bicyclists. Um, and so this is a formula that we um, uh, uh, iterate for um, all, of, all of the network. And I'd say that one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that there's always going to be places where um, you're going to be constrained in terms of right away or there's going to be a bus route that you need to prioritize. And it's very important that um, you, you, you keep the integrity of that low stress connect, connection because if one intersection becomes high stress, then the whole network kind of falls apart. And so better to have uh, a really narrow um, facility rather than something that's downgraded. Next slide. Um, design and operations working together is so critical um, because the operations folks are the ones that are going to be maintaining any of these facilities. They have a lot of really good ideas about um, how to design the facilities so that um, maintenance and operations can be successful um, further down the line. And so making sure that all of those staff are working together at the very beginning of the project to inform the process is, is really critical. Next slide. Um, and then the question becomes, who makes the decisions around this work? It's a very um, interdis interdisciplinary and collaborative process throughout agencies and, and with elected officials and key stakeholders in the community. But ultimately, you do need someone within the, the city or jurisdiction to drive the process and make decisions um, as, you, as you go down the lines. So, and we find that to be incredibly important. Otherwise, things start to stall out and some of the harder uh, decisions that, that need to be made um, don't end up getting made at, at key touch points. Next slide. 
Um, engaging the public, I'm sure you all know um, the importance of community engagement. I think that the, the key thing around rapid implementation bike networks is that you're really selling the network as a whole. You're not selling project by project, block by block. Um, by, by really selling people on the concept of a complete network, uh, you're not going to have to go out to um, kind of fight that battle block by block with, with various different stakeholders. Once you have um, sort of gotten the public's buy-in and understanding that this is an entire network is, is a bundled project, then you can start to have conversations with merchants around, um, uh, you know, effects to parking or traveling um, changes and those kinds of things. Next slide. Um, engagement doesn't stop with opening day, um, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar that innovative bike facilities can be um, kind of new and unfamiliar to all roadway users, and so making sure that people are understanding the changes to the roadway, how to use them, um, and also communicating the successes very early on of what you're seeing. Um, those successes don't have to be just for bicyclists. They can also um, talk about um, improvements for pedestrians and transit times and, and all kinds of um, elements to, to really share the successes of those investments in your, in your communities. Next slide. Um, so uh, I just want to recap some of the key ingredients for success, and if you can um, Continue sliding forward so that they're all populated. That would be great. I can't stand animations, but um, one of the most important things is that it's it's so critical to have champions in your community for rapid implementation. It's a very new idea for, for many communities. So making sure that you have someone in your council or board of supervisors or mayor who's really going to champion the idea, give them the political support and coverage that they need so that agency staff can move forward and get this good work done is, is uh, absolutely critical. Um, again, emphasizing the network rather than um, each street segment in the public engagement process and selling that as a whole bundled project is very important. Um, Ensuring that all of the facilities within your network are high comfort and never settle for um, a lower comfort facility or any gaps in that network, uh, especially at the intersections and interchanges where um, the most friction occurs. Um, focus on projects that show results quickly so that you can celebrate them and demonstrate that these are great investments to make. Um, and then really bring all of your collaborators together into a single team, designers, operators, um, your public engagement specialists, all of those folks, ADA um, experts, everybody really needs to be at the table to make this a success. Um, and then remember that the initial network is only the beginning. Um, so with the example of City of San Jose, they have built their, their rapid implementation network in their downtown. Um, and through their Better Bike Plan, they're planning to um, iterate and build on that rapid implementation network in all the surrounding neighborhoods um, to connect in. So lots of great work to be done. Really excited to see where this goes in the coming years. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke, for going over this and also more of the political implications of bike network planning. Um, and the successes um, in the U.S. and other cities. So next we're going to hear from Torsha um, Bhattacharya from the Rails to Trails Conservancy about um, one of the tools that they've developed for bike network planning. And as you can see, um, both the tools um, work together to sort of allow advocates to tell the story as well of the need for a complete network. And so um, I'm going to hand it over to Torsha um, now. So. Hello, can you see me? Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. And you can see my PowerPoint or? Not yet. Okay. Just 
And in the meantime, I'd like to also remind the audience um, to ask any questions that you might have um, to any of the panelists or overall. And then um, I had some in my email that I will bring up. Can you see my screen now? Or? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hello everybody, uh, and thank you for joining in the webinar, and thank you for um, hosting this for us and CalBytes. I am Torsha Bhattacharya. I'm the Director of Research over at Rails to Trails Conservancy. And uh, a little bit about our organization. We started in 1986, uh, and since then we have been working <clears throat> to build trails and build stronger communities across the country. We have uh, about 23,000 miles um, of rail trails already on the ground with 8,000 more uh, along the way. And initially when RTC started, our focus was to get the low hanging fruit to connect those gaps. But now over the years, we have uh, moved our focus or uh, increased our focus to include not just filling in the gaps, but completing networks of trails. And we have uh, these projects all across the US and we call them Trail Nation projects. And one in California is called the Bay Area Trails Collaborative, which is a 2,700 miles of uh, tra connected trail networks for the people to be connected to each other and to the destinations uh, that um, are important to them. So today I'm going to talk about Bikeable. It's the super awesome tool that we have. Uh, uh, it basically is a, a GIS uh, based tool. It's a routing um, tool. And if you uh, Google Bikeable and Rails to Trails, it should bring up the web page, but I've also included the web address at the bottom of this slide. Basically what the tool does is it routes origins that you can select to selected destinations through a network of street, trails, bike lanes, and any and all types of bike facilities. So what I'm going to uh, walk you through today is what, how we have worked uh, or applied Bikeable in two different situations um, in our work so far. The first one that Bikeable does is deals with the transportation component. And as we know, transportation and land use is interrelated. I'll then talk also about the, um, how we bring in the land use part of it. <clears throat> so for the transportation component, uh, what it does is that the whole network or the street network is um, divided into high stress to low stress um, infrastructure. And I, I feel I'm, again, once again, preaching to the core, um, you all are, might be very aware of where and how uh, some streets or transportation networks are super high stress as experienced by cyclists. And then there are other networks like trails, which are separated, physically separated from motor vehicles and therefore uh, have the lowest stress among all of uh, the facilities that we consider. So just a rule of thumb that the wider the road, the faster the cars, the more stressful a bicyclist would feel. And the flip side of it is the narrower the roads, more separation from direct traffic and slower speed limits would make people feel safer. <clears throat> now this concept of low stress is not new. We all know that it's been several uh, decades old, has been applied in several places in Europe, the concept moved to the, all of these uh, bike meccas that we have in um, around US, but it's recently uh, catching steam with where we see the dangerous by design or the leagues or RTC's report highlighting uh, the lack of connected safe facilities for bicyclists to actually achieve this mode shift, actually achieve uh, the environmental um, impacts that we think that it will when more and more people move um, towards a greener um, uh, mode of infrastructure. So uh, what we do is if you see in the middle, the initial picture that you showed you has changed and the roadway network is now colored into yellow, red and green 
uh, stripes. Basically, what we have done here is just assigned level of traffic stress to every single segment, as well as intersections uh, within um, a town or a region that we are applying the tool to. So now we can use this model to tell us which of the residences, or if you're taking residences as your origins, which of th those are connected by low stress routes to specific destinations. And then on the flip side, which are the residences that are not connected to where they need to go and whether there's a pattern there. And just to be clear, Bikeable as a tool is you can customize it super customizable so you can use the standard version that's included in the gis um, package toolbox but also when we work with a city or a community we make sure we are uh, talking to them and finding out what their destinations is where uh, the posted speed limit might be 25 miles per hour but drivers are zooming down at 45 then we move the stress levels from green to uh, yellow or red. Uh, so we are always working with communities to customize the tool to reflect the realities on the ground. And, de and that depends on the amount of data that's available. Um, and and it always dif differs from communities to communities. Now, uh, so most of the time we are trying to uh, route for not the strong and fearless where these bicyclists are open to riding with high uh, speed um, alongside uh, cars, but we are mostly planning for the ones that are not as confident. So they're interested, but the concerned group of cyclists. Uh, with growing uh, amount of information that we have with uh, GPS tracking tools, with health and fitness tools, uh, nowadays we get a lot of real time data available to us, but uh, for this tool, uh, we actually use proxies like width uh, of streets, um, speed limits, infrastructure, slope, things that are readily available to proxy what kind of stress a bicyclist might be experiencing. So this one the, uh, on your screen, what you see here is uh, the stress network for the city of Milwaukee. That's one of the cities that we worked with. Um, and every single road and uh, bike net, a network facility has been categorized depending on what the width is, what its speed is, what kind of topography um, exists within the city, and then are there any stress-reducing interventions um, that are available at these um, uh, crossings. <clears throat> what we see here, the pattern is the lot of small neighborhood streets here they're creating the islands of green space around here. And then once you move out, there are these orange streets that are medium stress level. And then they're almost cut off by these red ones that are super high stress. Uh, so these are not necessarily connectors, but we consider them more to be barriers um, to connectivity. And these are mostly um, either main arterials or highways. So now that we talked a little bit about the land use component, I'm going to move on to, uh, I mean, the transportation component, I'm going to move on quickly to the land use one. So uh, again, going back to the Milwaukee example, what we see here is the distribution. The pink dots are uh, the origins or the parcels in Milwaukee, and then uh, the blue dots all around the city are the destinations. Again, incre incredibly detailed and zoomed out, but again, you can zoom in on or, or out depending on um, your focus areas. <clears throat> we are hundreds of categories of destinations from the NAICS code that we pull. You can pull from Google Places or Business Analyst. Now, the next step for us is to, what the tool does, is combines the transportation stress network with the land use origin and destination that we, information that we um, just found out, and then gives us the connectivity results here. So as you can see on the screen here, the bluish region are the regions of high connectivity, where almost 
uh, a majority of the population residing in this area can connect to uh, destinations, the select destinations. Whereas in the outskirts, what you can see is orange and red areas. These are the zones that very few of the residents can actually access uh, destinations using a low stress bike network. Now, we also have to remember uh, one thing is that because this is a transportation and land use problem, there could be high connectivity without having a very good network, like in downtown areas where people uh, might be living close to tons of destinations. Or it could be that this is not available and the land use is not uh, as uh, appropriate. So therefore, up, out in the suburbs, you might have an excellent uh, uh, bike network, but there are no destinations that you could go to. So uh, what we did was once we looked at the trend in a bike network connectivity, we wanted to make sure that there was no disparity uh, as such that came up. Now, Milwaukee, similar to many American cities, um, it has a significant population that uh, do not get the minimum recommended, re minimum recommended daily exercise. And so we wanted to know if uh, people in there um, have proper access to trails or not. And we wanted to focus on the traditionally underserved uh, population in there. Uh, to, in order to do that, uh, we looked at uh, census-defined census uh, variables like poverty levels, minority population distribution, zero-car households. Uh, that gave us our subset of origins. And for our destinations, so that this one shows you what our subset of our study area is. Um, and then we moved on to looking at destinations, not just as places of gro like grocery stores, which you could if you're looking at food deserts or something similar. But we, what we did here was selecting destinations that were trail access points so if, to see if people had access, proper access to trails. Uh, the slide here shows you uh, the green access points are existing trails and the red and the blue line is the newer or planned trails. Um, what the tool found out was that 8% of the residents uh, in the existing condition could access uh, trails safely using a uh, bicycle facility, low stress bicycle facility. But once you add those future trails in there, the north, south, and the east, west connections, 66% of the residents boom. It just increases by a lot. So visually, this is a very powerful tool when you're trying to make the case for active transportation networks uh, in your city or region. Um, if you're not, if you're still not impressed with how awesome the tool is, I'll show you a little bit more of what else uh, Bikeable can uh, do. And this is a recent example of just a corridor analysis that we did. And the previous one was a network analysis. Uh, we recently ran a East Bay, Bray, Bay Greenway connectivity analysis. And this is in our Bay Area Trails uh, collaborative footprint. Uh, we looked at uh, East Bay Greenway planned improvements, divided the area into three sections of from uh, Oakland to San Leandro and Hayward, and then ran the tool in three different parts with and without the future improvements. And as you can see, for each of the existing and future conditions, uh, there was significant change in bicycle connectivity. So the results of the analysis, oh, it showed us for the entire corridor, there was a 16% increase in bike connectivity if um, it would be, um, that would be the case if the East Bay Greenway were to be implemented. Um, and that helps a lot of the city people to make the case for trails to get uh, increased funding for active transportation networks. So uh, I guess to just sum up my presentation, uh, there are many different uh, ideas and uh, 
end that Vicable can allow you to achieve. Some of them are uh, conducting low stress connectivity analysis in your region. Uh, it can also be broken down into smaller corridor level analysis. If you are a business looking to site uh, uh, your business in a specific city and you want to attract uh, bicyclists or pedestrians to your uh, business, you might also be able to use this tool to uh, determine where to set up your business. Um, uh, as a city, if you're looking for a quantitative tool to prioritize non-motorized uh, investments, this tool will also give you a list of the type of investments that will allow you to gain the greatest connectivity. Well, so for example, if you have 30 different projects, what are the five that will get you the most connectivity? And then you can start uh, implementing them um, uh, one after the other. And of course, what type of improvement? Is it a protected bike network? Uh, is it a trail system that you want to implement? Depending on that, your uh, solutions will be different and your increase in network connectivity, uh, low stress network connectivity would be vastly different. So I will stop here. And if you have any questions uh, or would like to talk to me about the tool, uh, my number, my email address is right on there and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Torsha. And um, we have a few minutes left for Q&A. And so I'm going to just take some that I've seen in the questions um, typed and also ones that were emailed to me. And I also want to remind all panelists that uh, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to go on CalBike's YouTube channel, as well as our website. and. Um, all of the resources and links that the panelists have shared today will also be um, posted as well, so you can access those. And so um, I really wanna thank all of our panelists today um, for really um, you know, sharing their expertise with us and the different tools um, and strategies that you know, we can really take into our advocacy and planning work. So, I guess uh, one of the questions that I had for you all was um, how much experience do you have to have already using GIS or other tools, um, geospatial tools to um, be able to use these? So that's probably more directed at Torsha and Rebecca. Sure. So, uh, hi, this is Georgia. I can answer that. So for us, we can do it in two ways. Uh, we work with the city of Cleveland to train their city staff in how to use GIS, but then uh, a GIS tool, but then the, the staff that were learning it had to have some basic understanding of how to use this true, um, GIS tool. But if you just want to use the, the tool to run an analysis, a one-time thing, we will run it for you. And uh, th thereby you'll not have access to the tool, but you'd still have access to the analysis. In that case, you don't really need any GIS uh, skills, but just interpretation of that. Okay, and um, I have used the BNA myself um, for some of the work. I think um, it perhaps requires a little more experience using um, other related tools, but is uh, on the other hand, an open source tool and we can link um, some of the resources there. And so another question that we had um, was, I guess if Rebecca, you could answer, how often is the BNA updated? Yeah, so generally, it, can you hear me? I just wanna make sure. Uh, yeah, now we can. Through. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so we update the BNA, um, we update all the cities in the BNA once per year. Uh, we just actually went through that um, process in, in February. We've got couple couple cities um, lingering to update, but 
almost all of them have been very recently updated. So, so typically, um, typically once a year, um, and it kind of tied into the last question. If folks want to run it themselves, there are there is some kind of technical knowledge required, um, but I'm happy to talk to them about what that is and 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 how to do that. Um, and we are hoping to we're working on actually developing a, um, a slightly easier version of the BNA. Um, it will still require some technical knowledge to run, but um, that will enable more folks to run it on their own so that they can get those results um, more frequently. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, so if, if somebody, uh, I know since we just updated it a year from now, it seems like a long ways away. So if, if someone is interested in results sooner than that, I'm happy to chat with them. And um... So my last question, since it is 12 o'clock, um, and I have a lot of our, both our panelists and our participants go. Um, so there was a question that um, we had, and Brooke had mentioned this, about um, measuring stress at the intersections um, and to not, you know, drop the low stress, you know, infrastructure at intersections. And so I was wondering if, um, you know, you all could speak to that if if tools, um, if the tools measure intersection stress at all, or if that's forthcoming or difficult to do, and uh, maybe Brooke about um, you know some advice on that, and we'll also provide some resources like NACTOs, you know, don't give up at the intersection, um, some design guidance as well. But I guess Brooke, um, do you have any? Um, thoughts on measuring stress at intersections and how to make sure to not drop at the intersection? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the level of traffic stress tools that we have um, can measure stress at intersections. And um, that's really the most critical piece of where you provide really good infrastructure because that's where we see, you know, the conflicts happening the most with turning movements. Um, the other place, obviously, is at, at, at driveways. Um, but in terms of the infrastructure, a lot of that has to do with how large your intersection is and what types of movements and um, that you really need to support there as well. Um, so there are a lot of really great tools for um, separating signal uh, movements. I think that the MassDOT uh, guide for separated bike lanes is probably the most up-to-date guidance on that, along with the NACTO Don't Give Up the Intersection, um, that really provides some good resources about how you handle um, the design of the, those intersections. Um, but I'd say that it's, it's pretty easy to provide a low-stress segment um, from, from vehicle traffic, it's a lot harder to design at the intersection. And so that's really where we see um, a lot of communities kind of get stumbled on. Um, and, and let's not, not forget as well about um, freeway interchanges, which are a whole nother beast um, in the tools around really managing speed and um, the, the kind of the mixing areas in, in those places needs to be thought through very carefully. Um. Thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, we're actually um, gonna wrap this up right now and all of the questions that we received via um, either in the question and answer box in the chat or that were emailed to me, um, we'll do our best to share um, those questions with panelists and um, answer those when we um, submit the resources um, and also post the webinar. Thanks again so much, especially to our panelists who are doing amazing work and I think really explained these tools and concepts extremely well. Um, and you'll be able to reference back to this in the future. So thanks all again. And uh, we will alert you when this is posted. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.